yesterday afternoon, I was, I was at the gym and I was working out and uh, uh, a guy came over to me that, that knows me and he was very saddened and he said, um, I just want to share something with you that uh, my daughter-in-law is divorcing my son after being married for 23 years, 23 years. And uh, I said, wow, uh, you know, why? And he goes, uh, it's a surprise to me, and it was a surprise to my son when he received those divorce papers. I said, what did the divorce papers say? Because I think you still need to give a reason. And the reason that she put down was um, we fell out of love. We fell out of love, so she's leaving him. And um, he knows I'm a pastor, and he said, you know, have you, do you guys deal with this in the church? I said, thankfully, not much, not often. Uh, I said, we, we have. It's very, very painful. We have. Uh, he said, what would you say to this lady? If a lady came in and was in this predicament, what, what would you say to her? What kind of counsel would you give her? And, 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 and along those lines, what, what do you feel people, what do you teach people in your church that, that they need to do in order to succeed in their marriages? That, that their marriages will continue without separation. And really without any hesitation, I said the number one thing that people need to do to guarantee success in their marriage is they need to fear God. They need to fear God. That was, that was in a sense, basically what I said right off the tip of my tongue. Um, and what I mean by that is this. When we get married, obviously love keeps us together and building a relationship over the years that we come to cherish more and more and um, the appreciation, the, the need to kind of even depend in a sense on each other as we get older, that's all good. But, but we also have to realize that that emotional puppy dog love that we experience on our honeymoon uh, doesn't always last. It, it, it comes and goes. Um, uh, the, the person we married, just like the person who married us, doesn't look the same as we did when we were in our mid-20s. Uh, that uh, different habits become maybe more common, and living with each other can simply be more frustrating over the time. And it's very easy when you, you, you seem like there's nothing, we're just kind of grown apart, the kids are now the house, we don't know each other well, I don't have that emotional affection for you, I'm not really as attracted to you physically as I was when we first got married 30 years ago, to just call it quits. And what I tried to explain to him was, the only thing at times that might hold our marriage together, or get us to do the right thing in life is that we fear God. That might be all you have. Because a day happened in the past when you got married on a platform just like this, and you made a promise to that person and a promise to God. We call that a vow. The vow was ultimately to God that said, in good times or in bad times, I will never, ever leave you because, parentheses, I want my marriage to rightly illustrate the union between Jesus Christ and his marriage with the church, and Jesus would never leave the church, even when the church is bad like we are. I will never leave you. I will never leave you. And because I fear God and fear breaking the promise that I made before my Creator, that I love God more than I love others, more than I love my spouse, more than I even love myself, I'm going to stick with this. I'm going to stick with this. He goes, you tell the church that kind of stuff? I said, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's easy. You should hear the stuff I normally tell them. That's nothing. <laughs> that's nothing. Proverbs 9.10. I'll give you a lot of Scripture today. A lot of Scripture. So if you want to try to follow along, you can. But even if you're a good sword drill Bible guy, you still probably won't be able to keep up with me. Proverbs 9.10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You hear that? The fear of the Lord is the beginning. You want to be wise? The baby step to becoming wise is you must fear God. And knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So that's where we're going today. Now, the questions you might have. What does it mean to fear God? What does that mean? And probably the one that's going through your mind right now is, is, should I, as a believer, because I'm speaking, I'm assuming mainly to believers today, should I, as a believer, still fear God when didn't Jesus die on the cross for my sins? And when Jesus died on the cross for my sins, didn't he 
satisfy God's justice? Didn't he receive the wrath in my place that I deserved? Aren't I now, as a child of God, the recipient of his love for me that will never be taken away? And if that is all true, why should I fear God? Or moreover, if the Bible describes God as a, 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 a father to me, and we have an intimate relationship, what kind of relationship is that when i got to be scared of him? Or, if it is true, how do I do that? That's where we're going today. We're going to try to answer those questions. All right, let's get moving here. First point is going to be the longest. Number one, how was the word fear used in the Bible? Did a lot of research here. There's basically six ways the word is used. And you can see on point one, I gave you five. I'll give you five. Point number two will be the sixth way, okay? So the first five are going to be ways it's used, and they're all bad. Point number two, the sixth way is the good way. Point five can be the good way if it's done right, too. First one of fear is very simple. It's the simple general fear that all humans at times experience. And that could be bad for us as Christians or not bad. Like, for example, if we're getting people getting baptized up here, people are going to be giving their testimonies. If you're like, I know I need to get baptized. I've heard this one before, by the way. I know I need to get baptized, but I'm, I'm scared to death to speak in front of other people. So therefore, I just keep putting it off. That's the bad fear. If fear is keeping you from doing something God is calling you to do, that's the bad fear. You need to overcome that fear. That, that fear is not right. Okay. Now, the other kind of fear is the natural kind of fear that just is cautious. And that's okay. Just because the Bible says you should not fear. By the way, I think that's one of the greatest commands that Jesus repeated more often than anything else. Don't fear. Don't be anxious. Don't fear. And you think, does that mean I need to overcome every fear? No. It doesn't mean you need to go on fear factor and have like 18 tarantulas dropped on your face, you know? And just say, i got to overcome this fear. I'm scared of spiders. And I, no, that's just stupidity, I think. <laughs> I, mean, I was writing this sermon, and I, I can't digress too much because we are pressed for time. But I, I do remember a picture that I've seen before. You know, you see pictures, and they just mesmerize. You just, like, your eyes just like, wow, wow. You've seen it before as well, I bet. It's that iconic photo taken, I believe, in New York City of about 12 steel workers. You know where I'm going with this one? And they're on this metal beam, like 80 stories up, in a nonchalant, uh, easy, happy-going way, chomping on their lunches. You ever see that picture? And I'm like, no way. No way. And they're not scared at all. You don't have to accomplish that. Okay? All right, number two, we've got to move on. These next ones deal with fearing God. So number two here now is some fear God. This is a bad one as well. And because they fear God, they fight against him. I found examples of this in Scripture. They don't like God. They're scared of God. They don't like what God represents. They don't like what God's going to call them to do if they have to submit to God because they love their sin so much. So they fight against God. Examples. Pharaoh. Right? He didn't want to do it God's way, so he fought against God. The Canaanites. The Antichrist. Obviously, all those who put Jesus on the cross. We want to eliminate this man from our lives. We fear what he represents. He's going to ruin our man-made religion. He's going to destroy the things that we worked for. He's going to take away our power, crucify him. The atheist. Why is it that you can talk about today anything under the sun, but all of a sudden if you stand and say, hey, I just want to talk about Jesus, wow, you'll get shut down instantly in our land of free speech, right? They fear that name. We want to fight against that. And I'll fight against Christians. Number three, some fear God. They don't, they don't fight Him, but rather they, they flee from Him. They flee from Him. How can we not remember the account in Genesis 3 
And the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? Obviously God knew, but he's just asking the man to respond. And he, Adam speaking here, says, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was what? Afraid. So I hid myself. Or Revelation 6. And the kings of the earth and the great men, the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us. They're scared to death when the wrath of God is being poured out at the end times. And it says to the rocks and the mountains, fall on us and hide us. There it is. From the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. We're scared to death. Hide us. The very beginning in the Bible, in Genesis, as I just read, the final culmination of God's wrath in the end, in the revelation of count, people fear God, and because of that fear, attempt to hide from his presence. And my daughter was uh, sharing her faith with a, a young man her age, 18 years old, and, uh, and just talking about the gospel. And, you know, he was a good guy, a really nice guy, and he was. He was listening. I heard the story from her. And basically she said, uh, you know, so what do you think about that? And he's like, you know what? A, I've never heard of that before. And B, I just don't, th- I don't like to think about that. So she's like, you've never thought, like, is there a God? And you never, never, like, where are you going to spend eternity? None of that? I just, I don't like to talk about that stuff. I don't, I don't like to, I'm, I'm a, I'm, I've been keeping it away from me because I don't want to go too deep into and find out what that really means. Another way, number four, some fear God, they fight him, they flee from him. Some do nothing at all. They're just complacent. Example would be that um, slave in Luke 19 who the master gave that mina to. Remember that? We talk about the talents in Matthew, but in Luke it's a mina, M-I-N-A. And uh, he was the bad guy who didn't invest his talent. And the master said, why not? And he said, for I was afraid of you. I did nothing because I was afraid of you because you're an exacting man. You take up what you did not lay down. You reap what you did not sow. And the master responds, by your own words, I will judge you, you worthless slave. So here's three cases, the last three, that talk about fear of God, but they're not legitimate, good, right responses to God. And the fear that they produce is not the fear that God intends based upon the results. God wants you, listen, to fear him, yes, but not to run away from him, not to rebel against him, and not to sit on your hands and do nothing. God wants you to fear him so that might prompt you to run to his presence and seek security from that awesome God under the shelter of his wings. When it comes to salvation, brothers and sisters, what are we being saved from? We use this word salvation. Saved. What do you say from? I was speaking to a couple Jehovah Witnesses about three weeks ago, right at the foot of the Golden Gate Bridge out of San Francisco there, and, I, and I, the first question I ask, and I like to use this with JWs, is, is uh, why did Jesus come? Why did Jesus have to die? I, I've yet to get the true biblical answer, but it opens up conversation. And these in particular, two ladies and a, a young man said, he came to give us a clear conscience. And I said, that of course is true, but that's not the main reason Jesus came. You talk to some churches, Jesus came to clear your sinus infection. He came to make you rich. He came to make you prosperous. Why did Jesus come? What is salvation? It's very clear. Jesus came to save us, basically, from God. We never think of it like that, but that's what it is. Because of our sin, the wrath of God must be poured out upon us. Because God is a wrathful God when anyone violates His will. 
Jesus had to come because we are guilty sinners. And God in his necessity to judge sin had to judge sin, but by his grace and mercy chose to judge that sin, not on you, but on Christ on the cross. You will call his name Jesus, the Bible says, because he will do what? Save his people from what? Their sins. And the consequent result of that sin, which is God's wrath. The goal of this is to realize there is a God and He should scare you if you don't know Jesus. And that you might fear Him and as a result of that fear, run to Him knowing that He is the only solution to Him. I have no problem saying that God is a God of mercy, which He is, and love and grace, all true. But let's not believe on a partial God. Or we become just like a Jehovah Witness that believes on a partial Jesus. He's also a God of justice and holiness and wrath. And we must appreciate God for who He is and all that He is. And because of who God is, as I said, if our sin is outstanding and has not been atoned for, we will face the conscious, eternal torment of God in hell. And that is fearful. got to be very careful, brothers and sisters, when we share the gospel. I have no problem saying God loves you. Of course he loves all people. But I don't see in the Bible spoken very often of God's just love for everybody. What I see spoken in the Bible more often is that you do not submit to this God and get your life right with him. His wrath will remain upon you. If it's just about preaching the love of God to the lost sinner, why should the lost sinner ever turn to Christ? Because the way I would reason in my mind is if God already loves me, why do I need him? Because God, if he loves me, would never send me to hell. You go down to Wall Street and just tell some rich, successful businessman that, that you need to give your heart to Jesus. And he'll look at you and laugh. Because in his estimation, he's got everything he's ever wanted. What does he need with a Jewish carpenter that lived 2,000 years ago that was hung on a cross? Hebrews 10.31. I want to give you scripture, folks, to back this up. It's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Hebrews 12, 28 to 29. Therefore, since we received a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable sacrifice with reverence and awe. We could translate that with fear. Verse 29. For our God is a consuming fire. 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 to 10. After all, it's only, just for, it's only just for God. Just. He's a God of justice. To repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well when Jesus is revealed from heaven. Second coming. With his mighty angels in flaming fire dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those, listen, who do not obey the gospel of our Lord. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power when he comes to be glorified with the saints on that day to be marveled at among all who have believed for our testimony to you was believed and Luke 12, 4. And I say to you, Jesus speaking, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after have no more that they can do. But I warn you whom to fear. Fear the one who after he has killed has authority to cast in hell. yes. I tell you to fear him. People today see no need for Jesus simply because they have a low view of God 
a high view of themselves and an absent view of God's anger towards sin resulting in eternal punishment. That's why people make a mockery of Christ and reject him and ignore him. And Jesus said in the final days, and it seems like we're at the end of the end days, that's how it's going to be. He compared it to the days of Noah. In the days of Noah, he said people were eating, drinking, giving in marriage. You know what that means? It doesn't mean that they were living heathen lives necessarily. It just means they were going through life, enjoying life. They were consumed with their vacations and their retirement plans and you know how beautiful their front yard looks and uh, family get-togethers and swimming pools and getting a new car and uh, seeing the birth of children and giving your children away in marriage. And I'm not saying any of that's bad. I'm not saying any of that's bad. I'm just saying they live for that. That's life. That's my God. That's what I live for. That's what makes me happy. That's what puts a smile on my face. That's what enables me to get out of bed. And God, when I got time for him, he sort of fits in the plan somewhere. And then the days of Noah, the rain started falling. Why? Because most people today, in my opinion, would say, yeah, I think there's a God. But who is that God? He's just the man upstairs. He just winks at my sin. He loves everybody and everybody goes to heaven. He's George Burns. Remember that blasphemous movie that came out like in the 80s or whatever? That's who God is. Basically, God's a big joke. He's there when I need him if I really get into a pinch. And I like him around when I have a prayer request that he can answer for me. But really, I can live my life just fine without him. I don't think about him. I don't pray to him. I don't read my Bible. I don't attend church, fellowship with other believers. I could care less about obeying him. I want to do what I want to do. The Bible says he's a consuming fire who will deal out vengeance and retribution toward any human being who does not have his or her sin covered through the blood of Christ. If there's any unbeliever in this room today, that's what the Bible says. And if I were you, I'd be trembling right now. Because the day will come that you're going to die. And you will face this God. And there's no avoiding it. And he's not the loving grandfather. He's a consuming, wrathful God because he must deal out justice toward those who violate his will by their personal sin. He must. That's who he is. And if he didn't do that, we should all just leave and go home because he's not a God that's worthy to worship then. Every unbeliever should hear about the severity of God's judgment. And the goal is not tremble, and go home scared to death and say, Mom, I just can't sleep for three weeks straight. The goal is to hear about that and to run for help. There's a solution that I'm sharing with you this morning, and the solution is God's greatest gift to the world, Christ. That God would love a world that has no hope of saving themselves, and God would say, I'll save you. I'll do the work for you. I will send my only begotten Son, the second person of the Holy Trinity, Jesus Christ at the cross. He will go to the cross. You know your, your, all your sin that you're going to get punished for someday? I'm going to take all that off of you. I'll heap it on Christ, and I'll punish Christ in your place. How's that for an exchange? And I'll give you his righteousness, so I see you with the righteousness of Christ, with all of your sin removed. You want that? How much does it cost? How many good works do I need to do? God says, no, it's a free gift. You give me your life. You believe on me on the basis of faith. You receive this by belief in what Christ did for you on the cross. You've no other hope but that. And all your sin can be wiped away. You can be adopted in my family, eternally forgiven, with the guarantee of heaven in your future. You want it? 
And some people say, as some might today, not for me. What does that say to God? The Philippian jailer, remember that Acts 16 who experienced God's power? Big, tough Roman soldier. Says he came when he experienced it, quote, quote here, with trembling and fear. And he fell down before Paul and Silas and said, what do I have to do to be saved from this God? When you go out and you see a a violent thunderstorm, that's just a sampling of his power. Mighty tornado sampling. What must I do to be saved from this God? And what did Paul say? Believe upon the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. Now, again, for the majority of you, you agree with all that. And if you're an unbeliever, I pray you agree with it today, and today you come to Christ, and you can be saved. But you say, I'm a believer. How does this now apply to me? I'm amening everything you're saying, but how does it apply to me? Because it says in 1 Thessalonians 1.10 that I have been delivered from the wrath of God. Should I fear God's justice still then? Are you saying that? Should I fear God's punishment? Should I fear eternal separation? The answer, of course, is what? Absolutely no. 1 John 4. By this, love is perfected with us that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. There you go. If you're a believer in Christ, he took away all your sin, you can have confidence in the day of judgment that you will shine and God will receive you eternally in his kingdom because Christ took away all that sin on the cross and you gave your life to Christ as he's called you to do in Scripture. Confidence. You're not running around wondering, biting your nails, saying, oh, well, you know, every, most every good Catholic will tell you, we gotta, we, uh, we'll find out when we get there. Really? And so your salvation is based upon your works. Good luck. Because it ain't going to work. It's based entirely on the work of Christ, confidence. Because as he is, so also are we now in the world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. Romans 8, 15. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again. What does that imply? You, once time before Christ, you should have been scared, and you were but not again, because you've been adopted, it says, as sons, and we cry out what? Abba, Father, which means Dad. The fear of God leads us to the reconciliation. It leads us to the forgiveness. But once we we have that, that fear of cowering before God's wrath has been removed from our lives. We don't fear God's punishment. He's promised us in his word that it's all been dished out on Jesus for all your sins, past, present, and future. We are recipients of nothing but God's love. So then we come back to our question. Should I as a Christian fear God? Point number two, here we go. And the answer to that is what? You guys are hesitant. You're fearful to answer that question, aren't you? The answer is, at least there's one affirmative back there. Thank you, Don. The answer is yes. Wait, now I'm confused. You got done telling me that if I love Jesus, I shouldn't fear God. And now you say, should I fear God? And you say, yes. Well, let me explain. First of all, the Bible gives over 100 references of God's fear, fearing God, spoken directly to or directly of God's children. Deuteronomy 10, 12. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require from you? I'm going to say one thing. I'm kind of interested in what that's going to be. To fear the Lord your God. You say, I want New Testament. Okay, 1 Peter 1, 17. If you address his father, the one who impartially judges according to each man's work, conduct yourselves in fear during your time on your stay on the earth. And that's interesting because it's connecting fear of God with the fatherhood of God. 1 Peter 2.17, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. 
demonstrated amongst Christians, Acts 9, 31. So the church throughout all of Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord. Abraham, Genesis 22, God said to him, do not stretch out your hand against the lad. You know this account. Do nothing against him, for I know now that you fear God since you've not withheld your only son. Joseph, Genesis 42. Now Joseph said to them on the third day, do this and live, for I fear God. Job 1.8, and the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. And of course, that dear saint, Proverbs 31 woman, who should be praised because she what? Fears the Lord. Matter of fact, it's not used as much anymore, but you go back, even like 10 to 20 years, a devout Christian was called a what? God-fearing individual, right? That is a God-fearing woman. That was not an insult. That was not bad theology. That was a compliment in the old days. He is a, let me tell you about this guy. He's a God-fearing man. That was a good thing to say. I haven't answered your question. What is it then? What's the difference between an unbeliever's fear and a believer's fear? It's simply this. Here's your answer. If you forget everything, here's your main thought, today's sermon. An unbeliever fears the wrath of God because his or her sins are still outstanding and they will stand before God on judgment day, God seeing all and knowing all, and will dispense his wrath upon them because he must in his holiness and justice judge all sin that violates his character and his revealed will given to humankind in the expectation that we follow his commandments. And the bottom line is every one of us is guilty apart from Christ. That's the unbeliever's fear. That should lead them to Jesus. The believer's fear is simply this. Thanks be to Jesus, that doesn't apply to me anymore. Right? But that doesn't mean I consider God as my buddy. He's not just one of the, one of the boys. He's not the, the man upstairs. He's not just the grandfatherly type that winks at my sin and just knows that, hey, you know, everyone makes a mistake here and there. But I kind of do what I feel like doing. The kind of fear that we should have as believers is one of reverence and awe. Think of respect. We in the evangelical church, I think, have done a very good job to bring this whole God thing down to a personal level. That we can have a personal relationship with the living God. But the problem is because we've got so personal, we've become a little too flippant, in my opinion. And now God's just like my homeboy, whatever you want to call him. I'm using the right terminology there. He's just my buddy. He's right. God's riding shotgun. Revelation 14, 7. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of water. That's who God is. Revelation 15, 4. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all the nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Psalm 33, 8. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let the inhabitants of the world stand in awe before him. Not fearing God is being bored with God. Yawning. Reading your Bible and watching TV at the same time and then doing and obeying what you read whether or not you feel like doing it. You know, I got little things in my house that I do. Like, when I stack my books on the table and I got my Bible, I never put books on top of the Bible. I'm not saying that you're in sin if you do. But just saying this book's always going to be on top. Reverence for the Word of God. When we read the Word of God as a family, not so much anymore now that kids are older in terms of these attitudes, but when they were younger, it was reverence for this book. I could tolerate more disrespect to me than I can when I'm reading this book and you're goofing off. This is God's Word being read. We stop what we're doing when we read God's Word. 
when we pray, we're realizing the God that we're praying to. It's a high view of God that realizes that God is not another created being. He transcends creation, that he is holy, which means he is set apart from all of creation, and therefore he deserves to be esteemed and exalted and revered and respected. If Jesus Christ were to manifest his presence again and come down into this sanctuary and stand amongst us, we're not going to be walking up to him and inviting him to join us in the fellowship hall for a bagel. We will be falling flat on our face. Spirit of Isaiah who said in Isaiah 6, Godly man, Woe is me, I am ruined because I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. It's the spirit in the early church when Ananias, two believers, dropped dead on the spot because they lied to the Holy Spirit. And it says what? Acts 5, great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard these things. The church was scared, in a sense, of God in the right way. We better start respecting this God. We do what he tells us to do. He's not a God to be taken lightly. And when I hear things that God expects me to do, I do them to the best of my God-given ability. I don't play fast and loose with this God. And I think the way this is happening in the world especially, but also to some degree in the church, and it's like fingernails on a chalkboard to me, when I hear people take God's name in vain. I'm not saying God followed by the bad word. I'm saying the oh my G-O-Ds. You can't watch, that's one of the amazing, I don't watch movies anymore hardly. You can't watch a movie without it being said. Let us take, we know the Lord's Prayer, hallowed be thy name, because your name represents who you are. And people are taking my Savior's name in a trivial way as an exclamation at the end of a sentence to try to make a more verbal point. That's fearing God? I think so often this cavalier lifestyle. He's King of kings and Lord of lords. And what this reverential awe does is it leads us then to obey him because we respect him. I'm trying to get in my mind the comparison between a parent and a child and God and us as his children in this area. Should a child fear a parent? If it's in the sense that my dad can just hull off and belt me for no reason at all, That's flat-out sin. I hope no child would have to live in a a home like that. Of course, there are some that do. That my mom just might chew me out. Or that my parents might promise me something special and then at the last minute say, I changed my mind. You're not getting that. Fearing the letdown or my dad who drinks too much and I never know when he's going to get drunk and embarrass the family or embarrass himself or hurt my mom. No child should have to live with that kind of fear. But yet we'd also say that there's a degree where a child should respect a parent, right? And there is a, in a sense, we could use that word fear. That, you know, my dad's going away on a business trip and he, he told me to not drive the car when he's gone and, and I'm going to do what he says. Because why? I respect him. I respect that what he says to me is wise. Because he obviously has a good reason to say that because he cares about me. He's not just being a taskmaster. He knows there's maybe something wrong with the car or or maybe he just wants me around because he knows I'm an inexperienced driver. But, But in giving me that command while he's gone, I will do it because I respect him. But I also respect the consequences of what will happen when I don't do it because I know my father will follow through on the commands that he gives me with discipline. So I'm not scared to death that my father's just going to come home and be me one day. But I respect my dad. I respect him. And when he says to do something, I do it. That's a small sampling of how it should be with us and our Heavenly Father. 
So fear doesn't just stay there. It always mood motivates to something, and in this case, it's obedience. Because I respect God, I do what he says. I don't understand this command. I don't want to do this command. It's going to be a major inconvenience for me, but I'm going to do it because I fear God. Here's the connection. 1 Samuel 12, 24. Only fear the Lord and serve him with truth in your heart. There you go. There's the connection. Fear God, serve him. Psalm 112, 1. Praise the Lord. How blessed the man who fears the Lord, who delights in his commands. There it is again. Deuteronomy 6, 24. So the Lord God commanded us to observe all his statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always and for our survival as it is today. All right, I gotta go to the last point. Running out of time here. Last point. Let me just make a very brief case of how fearing God is in your best interest. How fearing God is in your best interest. Real quick, just going to give you some Bible verses. Number one, you can see I've listed 10 on your outline. The fear of God will lead to wisdom. You cannot be wise if you do not fear God, Scripture says. Proverbs 1 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. What that's simply saying is, if you do not fear God, according to not my standard, but biblical standards, you're a fool. And until you start fearing God, you will always be a fool. You are a fool that a God has made you and is holding you accountable, and even as a believer, will one day call you into account at the beam of seat judgment, and you don't fear him, you're a fool. Because you will not do what, you, what he tells you to do. And that is the epitome of foolishness when you can look at the word of God and still do what you want to do. You're a fool. Job 28, 28. And to man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil, that is understanding. All right, number two. Fearing God leads to joy. You want to be happy? You've been created by God to pursue happiness. Fearing God will let you be happy. Proverbs 28, 14. How happy is the man who fears always, but he who hardens his heart will fall away into calamity. Psalm 112, 1. Praise the Lord. How happy is the man, it's blessed, happy, same word, is the man who fears the Lord and greatly delights in God's commandments. Psalm 115, 13. He will bless those who fear the Lord, the small and the great together. Very clear. You want to be happy? The Bible says, fear God. Respect him. Yes, it's intimate. Yes, it's a loving relationship. But it's also, it's God. Not your college roommate. Number three, fearing God leads to safety. Almost sounds paradoxical, right? We don't normally take refuge in something we fear. That's what the scripture says. Psalm 115, 11. You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord because he is your help and your shield. Psalm 14, 26. In the fear of the Lord, there is strong confidence and his children will have a refuge. We want safety. We want safety. Children in our homes want safety. They want security. They want safety. How do we get safety in our lives? God puts an umbrella of safety over us, and he says, when you do the things I command you to do, you're in a position of safety. But when you step outside of my will, and you start living your own life the way you want to choose to live your life, without Jesus being your Lord, you're in a position of danger. Come back into a position of safety. How do you get that position of safety? You fear God and respect the things that he tells you to do. Fearing God leads to life. Number four. Obviously, eternal life, but also here a quality of life. Proverbs 14, 27. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life that one may avoid the snares of death. Proverbs 19, 23. The fear of the Lord leads to life. Number five, fearing God keeps you from evil. Proverbs 16, 6. By loving kindness and truth, iniquity is atoned for, and by the fear of the Lord, one will keep away from evil. Proverbs 8, 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Number six, fearing God leads to his instruction. Psalm 25, 12. Who is the man who fears the Lord? That's a good question. How will I know? How will I know the guy who fears the Lord? Here it is. God will instruct him in the way he should choose. His soul will abide in prosperity, and his descendants will inherit the land. The secret of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he will make to them known his covenant. Fearing God leads to his love. Psalm 103, 11. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, you know this verse, so great is his loving kindness toward those who? 
who fear him. You want God's love? Fear him. Respect him. It's like any child, of course a parent will always love a child, but any child that just blows off a parent, it, it's, it's hard to really like that kid. And you give an expectation to a child and they just keep blowing you off? It makes it tough. But how you treasure a child that says, yes, mom, I'll do it. Leads to this compassion. Number eight, Psalm 103, 13. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. It's almost implied. If you're a believer, the way you know you're a believer is you fear God. Number nine, fearing God leads to his mercy. Luke 1, 50. And his mercy is upon generation after generation toward those who fear him. And fearing God, number 10, leads to his favor. Psalm 147, 11. The Lord favors those who fear him. Psalm 130, verse 4. But with you there is forgiveness so that you may be feared. The fear of God leads us to forgiveness and forgiveness will result in us understanding who God is and fearing him rightly. Not cowering before his wrath, but respecting him with awe and reverence. How have you done? How are you fearing the Lord? Proverbs 23, 17, Do not let your heart envy sinners, but live in the fear of the Lord always. You said Solomon was the wisest man second to Jesus that ever lived on the earth. God came to him one day and said, you can have anything you want. What do you want? And Solomon thought about it for a minute probably and said, I want to be wise. And God says, I respect that answer a lot. He didn't ask for health. He didn't ask for riches. He didn't ask for a long life. He asked to be wise. And as you know, Solomon wrote most of these Proverbs. Like 15, 16, it says, Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and turmoil with it. And then Solomon is at the end of his life. We know he didn't finish too well, did he? He stopped heeding his own advice. He stopped fearing God, and it led to sin. Then he writes a book called Ecclesiastes, which basically says, you know what I've come to conclude? That apart from God, life is meaningless. That unless you're going to do it God's way, none of that stuff really even matters. Because you're running from one idol to another idol, and none of it ever satisfies. And therefore, probably the final words he ever penned in Ecclesiastes 12, 13, he said this, the conclusion is this. This is from the wisest man that ever lived, inspired scripture, final words ever penned, conclusion of life is this, all right? If you're going to listen to anything, you listen to this, it's this, fear God, keep his commandments. But this applies to every person. Reverence for him that leads to delightful obedience resulting in peace, joy, and security. We've got to stop, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your grace and for your salvation you've given us in Christ. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. And thank you, God, for teaching us who you are. You are almighty, holy, transcendent, lifted up, exalted, separate from us. But what makes it so amazing is that God has chosen to dwell within us and to love us and to work all the details of our life out for our very good, and to give us your Holy Spirit as a down payment of our salvation, and to promise us that we'll be with you and to bleed on our behalf at the cross. An amazing relationship we have. Help us to keep it all in balance, Lord. Help us to fear you. Help us to remember that our responsibility is to surrender all to you. Bless those who will be sharing their testimonies now. We look forward to that, and we pray that you will continue to encourage us through your word, rather understanding who you are, Lord, and living our lives in respect to that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.